mute yourself and we're gonna press live three two go good evening everybody my name is bob winskowitz i apologize for the delay um it's uh we had some technical difficulties we're golfers not uh technicians here so uh, i do apologize and again my name is bob winskowitz i'm the founder of squares and I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining Squares Academy Live tonight. Uh, this is our monthly instructional series where we're gonna have legendary instructors like Jim McLean. And last month we had Sir Nick Feldo. So we'll have a lot more of this. And with that said, I'm gonna encourage you to, uh, uh, to join Squares Nation. And Squares Nation, you'll be notified of these type of events. Uh, you'll get special promotional offers and you'll be uh, automatically um, joined into our Squares Academy where you'll get free instructional videos from a lot of great instructors. When you join uh, Squares Nation too, as I mentioned, you'll get some offers, you'll get first look at new products. In fact, check out our website now. We've got a great holiday promotion where you get a free pair of slides, which are our sandals, free pair of socks, free spikes for life and $20 off is over an $80 value. So please check it out. With that said, I'd like to, uh, to introduce Jim McLean. Jim is a prolific author. He's an architect. He's uh, a worldwide speaker, a club designer. And as you all know, a legendary ex instructor. Uh, Jim has instructed names like K uh, Christy, Christy Kerr, Gary Woodland, Curtis Strange, Greg Norman, Lexi Thompson, Al Sutton, just to name a few. So uh, we're honored and, and excited to have Jim tonight. And what I'd ask that you do in the in the in this live stream, you'll see an opportunity to post a question and in the chat. And what I will do is ask Jim a question. So Jim, I'd like to welcome you to uh, this episode of Squares Academy. Thank you, Bob. Happy to be with you guys. Great. So I'm going to start out with. Um, with a couple of questions here that uh, people had sent in throughout the day. And so what I'd like to do is, is I start with this. Uh, Jim, if you had a few balance and stability drills, what would be your number one drill to promote better balance and better stability? Yeah, well, balance is, uh, is the key in all sports. It's definitely a key in golf. So we're trying to get balance and set up balance in the backswing, balance at the finish. Uh, and if you're losing that balance, then it indicates that you've got some issue uh, during your swing with getting your weight too far to your toes or too far to your heels. So it all starts at address, getting your balance and your balance points set at address. So we're looking at the width of your stance. I always tell my students to use the inside muscles in their feet and their legs so the knees pinch ever so slightly inward. So then you can feel the inside muscles in your legs, which is so important uh, in, in the golf swing. Uh, as you also, as you set up, we're looking at the tilts in your body to make sure you're not tilting too far either way. Certainly we're never tilting this way, but sometimes I see people listing too far to the right. That's no good. And then uh, looking down the target line, making sure we're getting our, our uh, structure set correctly, which means we're tilting forward. Uh, the, the head tilts down so we can look at the golf ball, but it doesn't tilt down so much that you're putting your chin against your chest. So that's, that really inhibits your rotation of your shoulders in the golf swing. So it's comfortably hanging down. Now, as you swing the, the arms and the golf club away, uh, this is a weight moving away from you. It's easy to move too far off. You're going to try to stay on the inside part of this right leg for a right hand. And as you move back into your right side, the right leg becomes your balance point, your balance area in, in the backswing. So as you get to the top, a lot of times we'll have people stop here at the top and your weight should be going a little bit toward the right heel. So it would look like this as we go, as we turn away, your right hip turns back, your trail hip back, and your weight moves a little to the trail heel. As we shift forward, the weight goes to the ball of the lead foot and then shifts quickly back to the heel. And when you finish your golf swing, you should be able to go to a good balance finish like that and be able to stay there for a couple of seconds if you need to. If you see that you're teetering and falling off, that's a bad sign. 
could be that you're trying to swing too hard or that you're getting your weight too far forwards or backwards in your feet. Great. A question here is, seems uh, I hit my driver well, but when it comes to fairway woods and hybrids, I'm always hitting up on the ball and not hitting them very well. Any tips for hitting better fairway woods? Well, first of all, it's very important to realize that with your three wood or your five wood or any of your hybrids, you're still hitting on a downward descending blow. And a lot of people are trying to sweep the ball off or maybe even help the ball into the air. And when you do that, you fall back generally a little bit trying to get the ball elevated, especially with the three wood, and you're not letting the loft of the club take the ball into the air. Now you want to make sure your shafts aren't too stiff because that makes it a lot harder for a lot of people that don't have enough speed to get a three wood into the air. But you're going to be hitting slightly down on a, on a three wood. And even taking a little divot's okay with a three wood. But you definitely are not trying to, eat. the two ways you'd make a mistake is letting your wrist cock the club, the, the grip backwards in your swing, uh, scooping the ball this way, or as you go into the golf shot, leaning back, getting too high with your lead shoulder, too low with your, your right shoulder, staying back too much, trying to get those fairway metals into the, uh, into the air. And this is a really big problem that a lot of people I have that come to our golf schools have with their, with their three woods, especially. Uh, another great tip with the three woods, make sure it's not too long. I see a lot of people that are trying to get more length or distance with their three wood, they have a very long three wood. And it's really tough to hit the center of the, the club face for, for you with that kind of length of the three wood. So a little bit shorter with the three wood. Make sure you've got at least 15 to 16 de degrees of loft on your three wood or a little bit more. But definitely not like a pro three wood that's got 13 degrees or 13.5 degrees of loft on it. Just too hard for most people to get that ball in the air. And then once you see that ball going, not going in the air, almost everybody leans back on it, Bob. They, they stay back on their trail side and they just can't get the ball airborne. And they start, you know, topping a lot of shots that way, of course. And they never hit a good, never hit a good fairway wood that way. Great. I've got a question here from Ed. Uh, Edward asked, Jim, what is your secret to covering the ball? <laughs> okay. So that's a, an interesting word, covering the golf ball. <laughs> it's a it's a teaching term and covering the golf ball can have a couple of connotations one is covering the golf ball with the toe of the golf clubs we have the toe of the club and the heel of the club and when you come in to hit the golf ball that you're turning the toe of the club or covering the golf ball with the toe of the golf club because a lot of people come in and, and they go under under it this way again maybe trying to scoop the ball or get the ball in the air they don't cover with the club but you also can cover it with your trail side. So for me as a right-hander, I'm covering the ball, getting on top of the golf ball with my right side. I'm covering the golf ball with my chest and my right hip, right knee, and that's called covering the golf ball with the body. So there's two mo most common ideas for covering the ball. One is the toe of the club covering the golf ball this way, or you could say your right hand, trail hand, covering the golf ball this way not this way. And the other one is to get your right side or your trail side up on top of that golf ball and, and cover it with your whole right side of your body. Great. Uh, I've got a question here from, from Bill. It says, can you, can you tell us about a uh, ball position? I assume that could be, you know, ball position on different clubs is, is what he's after, but uh, your thoughts on ball position. Yeah, Bill, if we were playing indoor golf, I would say you could play every shot in some position, off your left heel or a little few balls inside your left heel. But we're not playing indoor golf. We're playing outdoors, which means we're playing uphill lies, downhill lies, ball above the feet, ball below the feet, playing into the wind, downwind, crosswind, left to right, right to left winds. So it's a tremendous amount of variables in the game. And also for the average golfer that's a weekend player or an infrequent player, getting the ball too far forward in your stance is just the worst place you could possibly put the ball. It tends to open your shoulders, get you aiming too far open in, in your stance, 
a very weak position to be in. So I'm almost always moving that ball a little bit back or a lot back. If you had a choice to whether to play it off your front foot or your back foot, most people would do, except for your three wooden driver, would do a lot better to play it a lot closer to your back foot. But for most players, the way you'd like to play this golf ball is where your arms drop right down, straight down. And that, that's right between your feet, depending on how wide you hold and you, you stand to the golf ball. If you're very narrow, it would, you know, it almost look like you could play it off either foot, but it'd be right in the center right here. And then as you spread out a little bit, center of the stance is a great place to certainly play your wedges and your short irons so that you can strike down on the golf ball and spin the golf ball. So when your ball comes into the green, it's going to hit the green, take one or two hops and start to check and stop. If you have the ball too far forward, you're going to hit what we call a looping trajectory shot. When it hits the green, it just keeps right on going. Right. And, uh, you know, so many people want to know, geez, how do the pros stop the ball? How, what, what causes the ball to spin more? Well, solid contact is the number one thing. You know, hitting on a descending blow is going to help you run that uh, golf ball up the club face. That's producing spin and makes the ball stop. So I would absolutely implore people to get the ball a little bit further back. That also closes your shoulders, closes your hips, gives you a better turn on your backswing. The forward ball position, unless you're a very low handicapper or a professional golfer, someone that has a tremendous amount of lower body lean into the shot um, and, and a great rotation of their body. Yeah. They can play the ball more forward, but that's really it for the, the very best players. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to add, I've got a nice comment here from uh, Taylor Crosby. Taylor says, just to thank you for being a great mentor. Uh, Taylor is one of those, uh, uh, a great instructor there in the Carolinas. So uh, Taylor, thanks thank for Taylor. Doing yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what, what, uh, I've got a question here from Rick, and I, uh, Rick, I feel your pain on this. I sometimes hook my driver a hybrid, so I don't hook my irons. How do I stop the hooks? Okay, well, let's just see where we start with this. With the hooks, we, you know, I always like to go to first things first. So the first thing we look at are your hands, your connection to the golf club. Then we go to the feet to the ground, the two major connections in golf, hands to the club, feet to the ground. Let's start with the hands. <clears throat> with my glove hand, my left hand, I'm looking at how you position your, this hand on the club. It's got the most leverage on the club. It's on the top of the, of the golf club. And it's the most important club for controlling hooks and slices. So if you have a hook grip, meaning you're, palm is facing the ground more downward, that would be the first thing that a professional would do for you is to turn the hand more toward the target. The other thing is the position of this uh, left thumb. And you want your left thumb much more straight down the top of the grip to stop hooking. Now that would be good. We don't want to get it too far back behind here, which makes it really easy to turn that lead hand over. Then your, your bottom hand, for me, my right hand, uh, if this starts slipping too far under and it gets a little more up into the palm, that will really allow you to flip the right hand over really hard going through. So, you know, we, the grips say, you know, the worst thing to sort of for, for a pro to have to work on because it's going to feel uncomfortable, but having a, a better grip and a weaker grip is going to help you a lot before you take the golf club away. All right. So let's say you've got a good grip and you're still hooking the ball. Then we look at our, our stance and our feet to the ground. Now, somebody that hooks the ball is going to tend to have the ball too far back in their stance. They're going to have closed shoulders. They're going to be aiming out to the right. So we've got to turn around. I've got some nice lines I have here in the superstation. If I'm going straight down this line, I would really encourage you to make sure that your toes, toe line is slightly to the left. And that's going to feel really strange to get your body aimed to the left when you're afraid of going to the left. But I, I tell people... Aim left, swing left, and the ball won't go left. <laughs> it's, a goes, it's counterintuitive. So you want to get yourself around. A couple other little tips that I do with people is I just simply have them open the club face at address. Now, I don't have you start with your grip and then open it. I just have you open the club first, then put your grip on. Now I've already got my club three, four, five degrees open before I take the golf club away. 
And that's a great little tip for when you're actually playing and you're hooking it. So that would be like a quick cure. It's not the, a long-term cure, cure, but it's something that can get you out of a rip and snap hook when you're out on the golf course. You also need to look at your club face and, and determine where you're striking the golf ball. Shots that are hit out toward the toe are going to have the gear effect, which is going to be a, a really encourage a hook. Um, last year when I worked with Russell Henley, he was hitting hooks and he didn't like it. And uh, I, I put tape on like I always do with all, all the people I work with. And he was hitting the ball slightly on the toe with his driver every shot. So we talked about, you know, why is that happening? Is the, is the type of club head he's using, the, the shaft, um, or just he's not really aware of, of this slight little problem. So he just ended up, one of, there was a number of things we did, but one of the things was he just started lining the ball a little bit more into the heel of the club to start with. He just moved it in a little bit, like Jack Nicklaus do, does, or Luke Donald, or so many great players that I've played with will put the the ball a little bit more into the neck of the club, which is a, not a nice little, another little easy tip to do if you're hit, tending to hit the ball in the toe and hooking the ball too much. Great, that was great. I've got a question here from Chris. Chris says, what's a good feel to start the downswing for those of us who have overactive shoulders? Um, is he on the phone there? Do you, do you, do you know how old he is? Or just generally? Uh, by looking at, uh, he's not on the phone, but generally I'd okay. say he looks to be in his, uh, his 30s or 40s. <laughs> okay. Well, look, we know the downswing should start from the ground up. And that means from your feet to your knees to your hips. There's something called the kinematic sequence. And that talks about the pelvis first, then the shoulders, then the arms, than the hands in the club. But really, I think that's a mistake. I think it should be feet, pelvis, shoulders, arms, wrists, because the feet are really what starts the downswing. Uh, I think any good player understands that. So the correct sequence from the top, so you can practice this, I'll do it with a club, is taking the club up to the top and then leaving the club there and make sure you, you let the lower body, the knees and the feet start the downswing. And you're gonna immediately see that the hands and the arms move. I'm not trying to do anything with my hands and arms right here. But when I do this, I have a little free start where my arms will appear to drop right away, but I'm really feeling like I'm holding the club back. And one good thought is to take the club back here and just practice letting the lower body start the downswing. Now we have to be careful when we do this that we don't slide the whole, the whole unit forward ahead of the golf ball. We're not talking about that. It's something we call the squat or the sit down where, we, where we're starting the lower body and there's a little bit of a sit into the ground. We call that ground force reaction. So we're going down into the ground, rotating, and then the left leg or your lead leg will start to straighten up as you go through impact. That gives you the vertical forces of the swing. So then you're using rotation, weight shift, and vertical force down and up in the golf swing to get things really going. Now, let's say you're a little bit older golfer. Well, that stuff doesn't work too good for a lot of people that we, we teach. It sounds great, but it doesn't work too good. Now, for a lot of the older people that I work with, I'll have them go up to the top and feel like they leave their shoulders back here. Just leave the shoulders back and start the club and the arms first. Okay. Start the arms and the club first. And that will really shallow you out instead of the shoulders starting first, which steepens your swing and gets you right down on top of the golf ball. So if that's this sequence of movement, it depends on your, the structure of your body, your age, flexibility. If you're a younger player, starting more with the hips, knees, feet is really the way the tour players are doing it. But for a lot of folks that have trouble getting these shoulders to go too quick, you could just try to retard your shoulder turn, slow your shoulder turn down on the downswing, keep them back and feel the arms and hands start down. And there'll be an immediate response, by the way, 
when you start your hands down, this is going to move. My left hip's going to move. I don't have to try to, to do this. I start my, my club down first right here with my hands and arms. The lower body is a responder and it moves. The reverse of that is the feet and legs are the leaders and the hands and arms are the responders, which is really the kinematic sequence. That's really the way that the better players, the lower handicapped golfers get forward in the golf swing, the lower body leads. But there's a lot of ways to skin a cat, say, you know, as a way to think of the two ends of the spectrum. There's different ways that you can make this work. Well, that was great. You know, you know, you've mentioned uh, two or three times now about, you know, there's two connections in the, in, in the golf swing, the hands to the club and the feet to the ground. And, you know, it was interesting when I first talked with you about endorsing and wearing squares, we talked about those lightweight sneaker like shoes and how they couldn't facilitate, could not facilitate the swing. And I gave you my sales pitch on this and you started to smile and said, geez, you know what? it's about time somebody really addressed the golf shoe that it's, you know, it is as important as a club that you're swinging. And uh, you know, you and I just kind of went and bantered for about uh, 45 minutes about the importance of the ground up and the feet and the golf swing. Uh, do you mind just ch chatting a little about that? Yeah. Well, anybody that plays good golf or any teacher knows that they've got to use the feet better. And, you know, we, you talk to me a lot about the, the shoes and then we, you know, I mentioned ground force reaction and, you know, you ob obviously knew about that. And, and that's part of how you, you design these shoes so that you could use your feet better. So, so the wider platform and the squared off toes, which is squares, uh, let's all your toes um, go flat on the ground instead of pinching them together and creating kind of a little cramping in the, in, in the toe action. So, Everybody that I've had use the squares has been happy with them. I, we did the fundraiser and I probably had eight or nine people that were there, the fathers or grandfathers, the people that were there at the, at the fundraisers with the kids come to me and said they've gotten a pair of squares and they love them. And it, it, it's a very comfortable shoe to play in. It really flattens you down into the ground, which I love. Uh, my mentors are some of the guys that I worked with who are major champions. They always talked about being set up from the balls of the feet back to the heels and, and being flat to the ground. And even coming down, you'll hear people saying that they're flattening your legs into the ground. So what you've done with your shoes is made, made that a little more obvious to people, a feel for people. Uh, and, and I think that's just been a, a great innovation into the game. Great. Th thank you for that. Uh, I've got a question here from Jackie. Jackie says, short-sided in the thick rough, maybe 15 feet to the pin. What's the best strategy? Do I use my lob wedge? Uh, yes. The lob wedge is what I have right here. This is a 58 degree sand wedge that I have right here. Um, and there's a couple things you can do here on when you're short-sided and you've got a short pin and you're only 15 yards away. One is to open the club face uh, so you can swing harder at it. One of the worst mistakes that I see people make is they swing and they dump it in the bunker, or they double chip and they don't get, don't even get the ball on the green. So I, I think that was part of your question. Um, how dangerous should you be? Of course, this takes practice. But the other thing that you can do is grip down on the club. So again, that shortens the length of the club and allows you to swing at the ball harder and not hit it far. Uh, I think so many people take, have the club all the way to the end. They, they didn't really open the club face. They, maybe they thought they did. Uh, and then they take a kind of this longer swing and they kind of decel into the ball. And that's just the, you know, we don't decelerate into any shot, no deceleration into any shot in golf. So you want to make sure that you can, you know, put some heat on it going through it. And I'm going to give you a couple, a couple little more high-end things you can do and that is to set your legs wider and put your hands down lower and put the club back a little bit now you can really swing at it hard and it's not going to go very far now i'm not recommending that, that anybody try this in a round of golf or unless you're not playing for any money or in a tournament situation the club champion or something like that but you put your hands down lower like this that also adds loft and then you can put a little, a little 
zip on the shot and it, and it won't go very far. It'll go a short distance and you can play some spectacular short-sighted shots that way. I will say this, a pro golfer gives themselves every possible advantage. Um, they set up correctly. They do get the club in the right position. They use the right club. And I think part of your question was, well, should I do that? Well, you shouldn't do that unless you practice it, unless the lie is pretty good. Uh, otherwise, I think just getting it on the green when you've short-sighted yourself, which a, a, lot, a lot of tour players even are, are certainly low handicap golfers, well, let's just get it on the green 20 or 30 feet away. Maybe you could make that, but you, you make a bogey, not a double bogey or a triple bogey, which, you know, really runs that golf score up. So it, it's a matter of understanding how critical it is in your setup, the speed that you have to swing the golf club. And I, I want to mention one other thing that you need to keep the pivot going, the body moving. Yeah. Uh, it's not just a hands and arms swing, uh, which, you know, is, is a nearly impossible to pull off for, for, for a shot like that. Great. Uh, I've got a question here from Stuart. Stuart asks, uh, what's the best <clears throat> drill to synchronize the arms in the body? Okay, this is a, a really big thing, a synchronization of the arms, the club, and the body. So I watch a lot of, and I've been watching golf my whole life, playing it, playing tournaments my, most of my life, um, working with a lot of good players. So I think the best way that I do in my golf schools is tr I try to get people to just get a little bit of feel in their feet and their hips and move the club. Now, you could slow that down and just do the body and the club, but when you're out on the golf course, to feel like you're not just doing this, just swinging your hands and arms, but that you get, have a little turn both ways and you just get a little bit of this movement going back and forth. So you can start just a little bit and I'm feeling a little weight shift here too. Now, when I'm doing my weight shift, if you have the shadow on the ground or you look in the mirror, if I'm looking at you as, as the mirror and I'm gonna still feel a little bit of weight moving right and left, back, through but I'm not doing this and I'm definitely not doing that. I'm trying to keep a pretty steady head here, a quiet head, the ability to move back and through with a quiet head. And then this idea of, if I took the club away, which this simplifies things a lot. It's, we call it the elimination theory, but that's taking the golf club away and just having your arms, working with your hips and your knees and your shoulders back and through. When I do that, when I synchronize things up, as I go back a little bit further, you'll notice my arms go a little to the inside because they're attached to my shoulders. And when I go through this way, they go back to the inside or back to the left after impact. So I think doing small things correctly, effectively, builds into your big swing. And you'll, if you watch on TV, you're going to see a lot of tour players making these little small swings. And one of the things they're doing is synchronizing the, the club, arms, and body together. That's great. I've got a question here from David. David asks, do you find that the sequence that you use to initiate the backswing will be the same sequence that you naturally will use to initiate the downswing? That's a very interesting question. I don't, I don't get that very often. So we're talking about a reversal of the, of the sequence of movements, which Hogan wrote about in his, swing, in his uh, great book, Five Lessons. You know, it's, it's a reversal of my mentor, one of my mentors, Ken Venturi, talked about this uh, to it. And he said, one of the things that a lot of tour players do, but you got to have a fine eye to see this, is they start with the body leading the club on the back, so there's a slight delay of the club. The hands are following the body on the backswing, and the club has just an ever so slight lag. We call it a lag drag takeaway, which I've written about in, well, for sure in the last book I did, Build Your Swing. And there's a little lag here. So the club's the last thing to move in the takeaway. And then on the downswing, it's the last thing to move on the downswing. So my, my mentor, um, Ken Venturi, one of them, called it a paintbrush. He said, it's like taking a paintbrush and brush painting the wall this way on the backswing and then 
painting the wall this way on the downswing. Paint it back, paint it through. So you could start small and get that little feeling that the last thing to move on the downswing is this club head up here following the pivot of the body. <clears throat> well, that's very interesting. That's the first time I've ever heard that. That's, uh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here. Um, let me see here uh, from, uh, from another David here. It says, uh, will laying the face open too much in a bunker cause it to enter correct? cause it to enter correctly, but bounce up and hit a thin shot? Or is it a swing issue? Swing issue. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, most players will open the club face to a degree, which increases the bounce on the club. The bounce on the club is the angle of the bottom part of the club, this slider on the bottom uh, of the club. There's a, an angle the back end's higher than the front end, the leading edge right here. So there's an angle here. And you can increase the angle by moving the grip back or by opening the club face or by doing both. So you'll see sometimes on a short high bunker shot where a better player will lean the club back a little bit and open the club face. Now, with average players that I have at my golf school, I don't really have them open the club face. If they've got a 56 or or 58 or 60 degree sand wedge, they've got plenty of loft in the club. They don't really need to add loft to it. If you add loft to it, you got to swing harder. You got to have more speed. So I learned that when I was a young teacher at Westchester Country Club in New York. Um, I wasn't very good at getting the people out. We, we had 120 ladies that came to our ladies' golf clinics. There were 40 at 9 to 10, 40 from 10 to 11, and 40 from 11 to 12. Of course, there's 1,800 members at Westchester Country Club, a gigantic club, 45 holes of golf. And I was taught with a great teacher. But I had these ladies, and I don't want to do, do the, say the wrong thing here, but we were at the ladies' clinics, and uh, um, I couldn't get them out of the bunker. I mean, I was opening the club face, and I was, you know, the way I played them was to swing more to the left, use a little cut swing. That's how I learned to play as a kid. And uh, I hadn't really taught much. So uh, it didn't work. They couldn't get the ball, you know, from me to the, to the camera here. They couldn't get it out. They didn't, didn't have enough speed. I went over to see Claude Harmon over at Wingfoot. It was re regarded as the top bunker teacher in the country. And then, I, then when I was the head pro at Tamarisk in California, uh, Mr. Harmon was right across the street at Morningside. So I spent a lot of time with him. And he said, uh, you know, you don't need to open the club face. Uh, you use a lot, of, a lot of right arm and right hand in the swing. And uh, don't open the club face. Just to make sure that you don't lean the shaft forward. So very important to keep the shaft pretty much neutral at address. Make sure that you've got the ball for the average player a little bit in front of center. Uh, if you get the ball too far forward, again, you're going to have to have enough movement to get forward and get the club to go under the ball and come out on the other side. Remember, you don't hit the golf ball in a bunker. You're going to land about at least three inches behind the ball. Don't ever think somebody last <laughs> enters one inch behind the ball. That's, again, a big thing I learned a long time ago. Somebody tries to hit one inch behind the ball, and just the slightest mistake, you hit the ball first, and that's that just put a, <laughs> an X on the card because that ball is going in some ball terrible in there. place. It's terrible, yeah. So we, Mr. Harmon said three to four inches behind it, and that's the way I've always taught him. Um, and then to use more of a normal golf swing. But you enter behind the ball, you go under the ball, and you come out on the other side. So you need to take a large swath, a divot you could call it, or furrow of sand as you – strike the the uh the sand and come out on the other side the ball's somewhere in the middle and then make sure that you have the finish you go all the way through the golf ball that you turn through the ball because this this body is the, is a major producer of speed and power so you're not just hitting it with your hands and arms and it's not just a little baby swing we want to have some whip in there we want to strike down and through the through the sand move the sand out of the bunker out onto the green and and you'll be a lot better at bunker shots. I'm always trying to get the people that I work with in my golf schools to leave here where they know they can get the ball on the green in one shot. Yeah, we'd love to hit it five feet from the hole or two inches from the hole. But when you really look at the stats of the best 
bunker players in the world, they don't hit it that close over the course, course of a year. They're about 10 feet. So if you hit it on the green 20 or 30 or 40 feet away, if it's on the green, you've done good. Great. I've got a question from RL. It says putting setup. It seems there's a variety of ways that play is, to play a setup over a putt. Is there one way that works better than most right, right, right eye dominant, if that matters? Yeah, I think the yeah, eye dominance matters a lot of how you, how you see the line. But putting is the most individual of all things in golf. You watch all the different ways that people putt now. The attaching the, the putter to the, to the lead arm, to uh, the claw grip cross-handed grips, split grips. You know, there's all these different grips that the best players in the world are, are doing now. So you can mess with your grip and also with where your eyes are placed over the golf ball. So it used to be everyone was taught to put their eyes directly over the line. But then we look at the, some of the greatest putters in the world. I, I worked with Brad Faxon for a decade. So I, I know Brad very well. And his eyes were a couple inches inside the line. I always saw that. And Ben Crenshaw, or another, you know, this is going back in time, but he was uh, probably the best putter I've ever seen. And he had his eyes inside. It's okay. Jack Nicholas had his eyes directly over the line. And I think that's a good way to do it. Um, but there's different setups. I think your eyes should be pretty close to over the ball. And I don't like the eyes on that side of the golf ball where you're looking back. That generally is not good. But a right eye dominant punter, like say Ben Crenshaw, super right eye dominant. So he, when he, when he looked at the target, if I'm looking down at you guys at the target, I mean, he was, he would turn his head this way, you know, kind of had an odd look, look to him. He's very right eye dominant. And if you're right eye dominant, you also can't see the hole very well. So it's very easy for a right eye dominant person to look at the target too quick. If you're left eye dominant, like Jack Nicholas or Tiger Woods, then, you know, you can see the hole with your peripheral vision this way and then it's a lot easier for that left eye dominant person to mm. keep keep your head steady that might be one you didn't know either bob I <laughs> just, just for I've that doing we're doing this a while just I've for that we're doing at eight o'clock not seven no i'm like <laughs> All right, uh, I've got one here. It's uh, from Arthur. Arthur says, "You taught me to finish the swing around my head and neck to get distance." Explain that. Yeah, well, you know, they they say the finish might, and a lot of people might say the finish is not that important. But when you look at the greatest players in the world, they go all the way through to the finish. And and another one of my great mentors, Jackie Burke, down in Houston, Texas, has been such a great person in my life. You know, way back, he would say, finish with your net, your club on the neck, and you're going to be a pretty good player. And he had one other thing. He'd say at the top of the backswing, point the club at the, at the target at the top of the backswing and finish on your neck, and you'll be a pretty good player. And I have taught that to so many people. I think a lot of people increase their grip pressure as they come through, and they kind of hold off the swing, and they don't get to the finish. That also retards the rotation of the shoulders. So when you watch a tour player go through it, they go around so far, their, their back is facing toward you at the finish. I mean, they keep this, we talked about covering the golf ball earlier on. And they're, this, for me as a right-hander, this right shoulder keeps moving and, and it keeps going around. And also with the relaxed arms, I just hate to see, you know, sometimes you hear about a high finish, but a lot of people interpret that with their arms going way high into the finish. And so then you have the grip of the club and the end of the club kind of going at the same speed uh, to the finish. Whereas I want this club head to get around the grip more like that's a little exaggerated, but that's, that gets that club going around the, uh, a lot faster. So again, I've always worked on speed with my, with my students and I've always loved a great finish. Um, Christy Kerr was here this week. Uh, she had dinner uh, with us at uh, Joe's Stone Crab. Was my favorite. If you're ever in Miami, it's one of the, <laughs> the greatest restaurants in, in anywhere. Uh, but I'm just looking at her picture up behind us right here. And she always goes to the ice taught her since she was a young girl. And she always had that great finish. Now, how good is Christy Kerr? Well, she was the number one junior in the country, the number one amateur, and then the number one professional in the world. She's the greatest American player of all time. So, you know, she, she did 
that little finish, Lexi Thompson did the same thing. There's a lot of signature finishes, by the way. Uh, Trevino would go through and he kind of have that little fade. And that's a fade finish. And Tiger would go through and spin the club down. You know, the spinner finish, Justin Thomas copied that. Johnny Miller had one of my favorite finishes. He'd go all the way through and then he'd bring the club down on the golf ball and he'd put it right on the pin to see if the ball went straight down the flag. And um, <laughs> Peter Jacobson, I worked with, like had that little saying too. He said, I'm dotting the eyes. I, I said, well, I've never heard that before. What's dot, what do you mean you're dotting the eye? But I, he said, well, the pin is the eye and my golf ball is the dot. And I want to see the, the coming right down on top of the pin. But that's pretty, that's pretty high end golf. That's when uh, Peter was uh, making a couple of Ryder Cup teams for the United States. He was dotting the eye. Great. I've got one here. It's uh, I got it via text. It says, um, as, a, as a golfer in my 50s, I've lost distance over the years. Uh, what things can I do with my swing to regain distance, given I am not as flexible as I used to be? Yeah, you know, that's the first thing you'd want to try and regain as much as you possibly can, the flexibility. Um, trying to do things with bands, just trying to stretch out, I think, just a little bit. You don't have to do too much. I don't do very much. I haven't for, I'm not been a big exerciser, but um, doing those stretches is just critical for, for keeping your speed as you get older, for sure. And then um, checking your equipment, making sure you've got the right shaft now. Uh, some people need a little more kick in the shaft as we get older. You've got a lot of years left from your 50s. You've got a lot of years. You can get a lot better and you can get a lot faster. You know, we're working on speed with people nonstop from the youngest kids to the oldest people I work with. I work with the guy that comes down every week. He's 85 years old. And he drives an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half every week. That's the truth. And he's still working on the speed. And I work on the speed with him, you know, to, to, get, to get him to go through on plane. Uh, make sure, you know, if you've got an off plane golf swing, it's going to slow you down. You've got to get this club whirling around you using centrifugal force as your friend. And also making sure you're not grabbing this club too tight. So there's, there's some stuff that they're saying, well, you can hit it further if you grip the club tighter. You know, I, I don't think that's right at all. Uh, I'm trying to loose muscles, relax muscles, and getting this club to whistle through there. So with, with your practice swings, Make some fast practice swings when you go to the range and definitely hit some hard drivers um, from time to time when you go practice. Don't care where the ball goes. You've got to you know, build some speed. You, you've got to learn to swing the club faster, and there's just no, no way around it. You know, you've got to learn to get some speed. Now, when you do that, you're going to get some missed hits. And I think it's – Pretty sad, actually, what's happened to a lot of golfers because they see the pros are hitting it so unbelievably far. And it's really fun to see that, no doubt about it. But they're swinging out of balance. Um, but they're swinging too hard. But for somebody that's lost distance and loves golf in their 50s, I would say you need to be able to swing pretty hard at it and, and keep your balance. But you're not just trying to powder puff that ball out there. You've got to you know, work on your speed if you're going to hit the ball longer. Great. I've got a question here from uh, Pamela. Pamela says, what is your advice for uh, a Q school first timer? Wow. <laughs> well, I've had a lot of players go through Q school. And uh, the one thing that we do in golf that doesn't work is try too hard. And putting too much effort is a bad thing in golf. It works for a lot of other things we do in life. But being able to chill out a little bit, I think some of the mistakes I made would be to over-practice uh, when I got to the event. Um, and, and I see on the PGA Tour and the LPGA Tour, they, the players play. They may go hit some balls for a little bit afterward, and then, then they leave and they go relax, get a good dinner, whereas I would maybe practice till dark. And now I know Bryson DeChambeau does do, you know, he does go till dark sometimes, and he, he is an animal. But I think he's able to relax. He's, he's been a great player since he was a little boy, obviously an NCAA champion and a U.S. amateur champion before he went on the PGA Tour. The guy's just a phenomenal golfer. But I think trying too hard when you get to the tour school 
is, is a big thing. I would say going into the tour school, you've got to just spend huge amounts of time on your chipping, pitching, and putting. A lot of work on the inside of 10-foot putts. Uh, it's really going to come down to how well you can get it up and down, how well you can putt, whether you're, you'll make it through. Great. Um, I've got a question here from Ty. Ty asks, can you explain the pivot and how to improve? Yeah, well, when we talk about a pivot, we start from the ground up. Uh, we kind of went through this a little bit, but you can put a club right on your hips or you can put it on your knees, but we'll start with the hips because the hips have to, to rotate and turn in order to get your shoulders to make a full, let's say a 90 degree shoulder turn or more. But the hips are going to rotate and turn and that moves my shoulders, let's say 45 or 50 degrees with me doing nothing with my shoulder turn. Uh, so this pivot right here, the, the weight comes off the inside. We talked about starting on the inside of the left foot. This left knee, you can't just go back and leave your left knee frozen here. This knee has got to move inward and behind the, say the golf ball is right out here behind the golf ball and the weight will move into this right leg on my trail side as I, as I go away without having my head slide with it or reverse pivot. And so the, you know, the pivot, when I think of the pivot, I'm thinking hips or the pelvis. And this is going to be my pivot back and through, but you were mentioning pivot on the backswing. So I'm thinking I'd, I'd have a lot of times I'd have people do this one of two ways. One would be to turn your shoulders and have no hip turn. So it's, I can turn my shoulders maybe 40 degrees, let's say, without moving my hips. And then I add the hip turn or rotation. And now I'm getting a really big turn. So I did this and then turn away and I could get to a, you know, at least a 90 degree shoulder turn. Or the other way to do that is turn everything together at the beginning. So I turn them everything. Now my shoulders are, have turned at least 45 degrees here. And now, I'm, now I kind of resist a little bit here and finish my shoulder turn. And again, I can get that big differential between my hips and my shoulders. So I'm thinking, I wrote in the X factor that the hips turn between 40 and 65 degrees, the backswing, which that's, I wrote that a long time ago. And that's proven to be pretty much that corridor within which good players turn. The only way you can really turn your hips Eight, let's say 80 degrees would be if you if you turned your hips level and you and you stood up and then you could turn your hips like this and you would kind of match your shoulders and hip turn up but of course you have to stand up out of your posture out of your golfers framework to do that and I definitely don't want you to do that right I've got a question here it's uh What's your opinion on having good tempo? Important. Uh, tempo is can be a, a, a song you sing in your, in your brain as you take the club away. You, you, Sam Sneed was kind of famous for his tempo, and he would sometimes whistle when he practiced. He whistled a little tune. But you could count you know, one and two when you swing. This, but make sure you add the and in there. It's just not one, two. So that's this time at the top of the swing. That's where you really see the tempo. And that's where a good player, even before their arms reach the top, they're already shifting a little bit forward. And that gives you the appearance that there's a, a slowness to their swing. But they're swinging the clubs up and down so much faster than an amateur golfer. It's just hard to believe. When I compare uh, most people to a pro, they'll say, well, compare me to Freddie Couples or Ernie Els or, you know, Brooks Kepka, and they'll be about right here in their backswing and Brooks Kepka and Freddie are finished with their swing. Uh, <laughs> so it's crazy, you know, but it it's, does look slow. It looks slow. A great swing has a beauty, a, a beauty to it. Now, Brooks Kepka, I mean, excuse me, Bryce DeChambeau looks like he's swinging as hard as he can. And, and he is, uh, and he's just, Unbelievable, they can usually hit very close to the center of the club face and hit phenomenal shots. It's just, it's just amazing to see. Uh, the ball doesn't curve as much as it used to, that's for sure. And the equipment's a lot better, it's lighter. And you're just seeing power golf uh, from high school golfers to college golfers to the PGA Tour. And 
distance has been important for a long time, but not as important, I, I think, as, as it's been the last, say, 15, 10, 15 years. I've got, uh, I think we've got time for a couple more questions here. It's, uh, I've got one here from Paige. And Paige asks, uh, how do I fix a reverse pivot? Definitely want to fix a reverse pivot. You know, I, I, that's something I hate to see. Um, now, a reverse pivot can come from trying to keep your head too steady, fixating your head. It can, it can come from not trying to shift weight in the backswing. Uh, but a reverse pivot happens when you transfer more with weight to your front leg and your head moves toward the target and the backswing. And a lot of times it can be when you try to turn your hips right away at the, at, from the beginning of the, of the backswing too, or you just wrote like you're rotating in a little barrel and you turn your right hip this way and you lean over on your left side. And then the, the reverse on the downswing is you reverse back a little bit. And I, I think the easiest way for me to try to show, to tell people this is when the, when the club goes to the right away from the target, you go away from the target. And when the club goes forward, you go forward. Why would you want your weight to go the opposite direction of the golf club when you're swinging? So that's just a simple way that, and I was learned from watching great teachers teach the club. As the club moves away here, you're, you're going to have the weight of the club and the weight of your arms moving away. So that's going to put a little more weight over here on your trail side. And then when you go through, you definitely want to put your whole weight of your body, the mass of your body on the golf ball. You definitely don't want to be going backwards to hit it because right, you're going to hit it really short doing that. Okay. A question from Sandra. Any swing changes for golfers with bad backs to pr prolong their golf life? Great question. So a lot of us have had back problems, and that can come from other things we did in our life, other sports we played, car accidents, or just spondylosis or some other issues with your back. And a lot of people, well, they'll be tremendous amount of people in America or around the world have back problems, but they haven't done anything. They haven't had any major accidents, but yes, you want to, you want to try and get into a, a little more erect posture at address. I don't think bending over, getting a lot of spine tilt is a good thing at all. You want to be a little more erect. And then when you go through, you want to stay tall. I'm going to use my right side as a, as the example here as a right-handed player. I want to use, keep my right hip up, my right knee up, and my right side a little bit taller as I go through. And then when I go past impact, I wanna not try to stay underneath it. Don't try to get that pinch in your lower back. Just let your right side keep going. And we go to a straight balance finish. What you see with a lot of players, of course, Tiger Woods has always had a little bit of that, except for a few years when he worked with another teacher and he did work a little bit more under, which I think probably exacerbated problems but he's finishing you know really straight up and down now Hal Sutton always had that kind of swing where he was way up and Curtis Strange if you go back years Brooks Kepka gets up there pretty good too when they, when they finish they're, they're trying not to a lot of players hitting thousand balls a, a day uh, if you stay underneath the ball too much try and stay in your tilt too long as you go through you're going to have a lot of pinch in, your, in the lower lumbar spine and you are going to end up with really bad back issues. So the straight balance finish is huge. Absolutely let your head drift a little on the backswing and drift on the way through. Do not freeze that head in one position in the golf swing because that's really going to hurt your back. Yeah. Jim, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, take a, a minute or two and tell us about your new app. Um, I, I have seen it and it is, it is great. I, I have to tell you, it, it is fun. I, I really enjoy it. Well, you can go to the app store. We've been doing good with that app. Um, thanks to Squares for being one of our sponsors. We're really huge. Um, everyone that takes a lesson at our golf schools or takes a private uh, lesson with us gets automatically gets the app. But anybody can go to the app store and, and grab the app. There's hundreds and hundreds of uh, videos in there. There's archives from talks I've done in different places. I've got the uh, Ben Hogan video on there, which is I spent a lot of, a lot of time doing that. Uh, I think, I, I just think it's a tremendous way to get a lot of information for the way that I've learned to teach the game. Um, so I think if you're interested in golf, it's uh, 4 dollars a month. It's probably the best deal in the history of golf, really, to, to go get that. And uh, I think you'd be very happy with it. 
I couldn't agree more. And Jim, your golf schools, can you tell us uh, if, uh, you know, coming up, um, how we go yeah. about getting uh, getting connected with the yeah. people golf schools to learn more about them? You go to jimmcclain.com. It shows you you can sign up online or you just call us. There's a number is there. It's 305-591-6409. Uh, but just going to jimmcclain.com. Uh, our schools are filling up for the winter. I'm doing a bunch of schools myself. We've been doing a lot of schools here. The weather has been just unbelievable down here in Miami. And, it's, you know, it's just generally great all winter. Um, it's a fun place to come to. So I think that's why we, you know, I've been in Miami for over 30 years now. And, um, you know, we've developed a pretty good reputation in, in, you know, worldwide in schools. We have people coming from all over. Now, I hope the COVID's okay this year because nobody could come from my students from uh, Spain and Italy and Switzerland and, and Europe. They just, they couldn't get over here. So I'm sure hoping that's good, but most everybody's traveling in America right now. I don't, we're, we're maskless in uh, Florida. I know, I know that we're pretty, pretty free. It's a free world down here, man. And uh, uh, everything seems to be going good. I sure hope that some of the people in the, watching this program will come down this winter. I think they have a great time. Uh, there's there's been a bunch more questions, but Jim, out of respect for your time at 702, and I'd like to personally thank you for all your time and your willingness to do this, part of Squares uh, Squares Academy, and I'd like to wish you, your family, and everybody listening here a very Merry Qu Christmas and a, and a Happy New Year. Same, so, same, yeah, same thing. Happy holidays to everybody out there. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate Jim, it. Th thank you. Have a great night, everybody. And again, thank you very much for, for joining us here tonight on Squares Academy. Have a good night.